this word that we're talking about this uh, still morning is a very impactful word. This word that I'm talking about on this hour uh, has a lot of kick to it, has a great deal of punch, we might say. Word I'm talking about this time is a word of great controversy. It is a word that has been all but eliminated in many of our circles. We may attempt to use this word synonymously as to not speak uh, this word in many contexts. And I'm talking about the word obedience. I'm talking about obeying, obedience. It has been a curse. It has become a curse word in many circles. In fact, it is a word that we try to avoid as much as possible, even though it may be necessary in, in a particular context. But we'll try to find synonymous terminology as to avoid mouthing these words. Employers do not tell employees to obey them. Why? We would be offended if our employees told us, our employers told us to obey them, but they'll find another way to communicate obedience. They would say things like, you need to follow the guidelines. You need to apply the rules. You need to follow um, protocol and all those kind of things. Anything but you need to obey me. We don't say that. Husbands, you don't tell your wives to obey your will. I heard an old Four Tops song and, 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 and uh, Levi Stubbs said, it's my will. It's my will. She will obey. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Levi couldn't sing that today, could he? So we don't say to our wives, you need to obey me. It would be proper to say such a thing. But in our society, it has all been cast out, even in the society among God's people. It's something you just simply do not say. So you might find a husband pleading with his wife to just listen to him. Baby, please just listen to me. Pay attention to what I'm trying to tell you. Listen to me or something like that. But he's not going anywhere near that word obey. Parents. Rarely say this word to children anymore. They might say things like you need to do what you're told. It means the same thing, but they will not say you need to obey my will. This is typically what we do. We tend to do this with God. People tend to do this with God and his and his will, his his um, his words and the things that he has provided for us. We tend to take the words and the principles given by God and make them bad. Because they are not going in the direction we carved out for ourselves in society. Greek word is hupakeo. Hupakoe, I'm sorry. Hupakoe. And it means attentive hearkening. That is by implication, compliance or submission. Obedience. To make obedient. To obey. Let's see if we can ascertain some understanding about such an impactful word. Obedience. First, let me talk about the necessity of obedience. Look at John chapter 14 and verse number 15, and let me put this in context for you. John 14 and verse number 15, Jesus used this idea of obedience as a manifestation of love. That's why it is necessary for us to obey. John 14, 15, notice what Jesus said to the disciples. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What is Jesus saying to the disciples? The disciples were trying to show their love to Christ by grief. They wanted to show their attachment to him based on the grief at his departure. John 14 is coming out of John 13. And Jesus had told the disciples that he had to go away. And because he had to go away, it made the disciples sad. And when you come on down to the context, Jesus is trying to encourage them. That I'm going to take care of you. I'm not going to depart. When I depart and go away, it's going to be all right. And as you get on down to the context, Jesus says, if you love me, Jesus wasn't saying it was improper for them to show their attachment to him by their sadness and their grief. Jesus was saying there is a better way. There's a greater way. If you love me, here's how I want you to manifest it. 
If you love me, don't try to manifest it simply by showing you attached to me because you are sad, because you are grieving. And that's the way you show you love me. Anyone can do that. It is not a perfect way. It is not a perfect way. And you and I have proven that even in our own generation. Jesus says, if you love me, show it and manifest it by demonstrating your obedience to my will. That's what he's saying. Surely it's okay to show your love for me in that manner. John chapter 13 and verse number 33, if you're taking notes, and also John chapter 16, verse number 5 and 6, and also verse number 22, shows the same idea of their sadness and all those kind of things and their love for Jesus through this, through this avenue of their emotions. But notice, it is, it is a sad thing and imperfect when people try to show their love by grief at someone's problems or their deaths or what have you. Because let me tell you what ends up happening. Some will behave in, in a grieving way to show their attachment to someone at the bad news of someone's demise or someone's illness or someone's sickness. But when that person was well, they weren't even on speaking terms. And then as soon as the news comes to them that so-and-so is sick, gravely ill. Now, I haven't talked to that person for two years. We fell out and we don't have much of a relationship. But upon finding out that that person has become gravely ill and now I contact them. Here comes this outpouring of emotions. And now I want to show that person how much I love and respect and care for them. But let me tell you something. What would have happened had you not gotten that news? You would have continued in the broken relationship that you were in prior to getting that news. That's why it's imperfect. Jesus didn't want the disciples just trying to show his attachment to them by their grief and by their sadness. And that's the way you show you love me. No, he showed them a perfect way, a better way. Show you love me by keeping my commandments. Same way a disobedient child sometimes would do to a dying parent. They did not respect them, did not obey them, did not cherish them, sometimes barely speaking to their parents and then finding out that news. Here they come. And now they want to show all of this love toward them as they are gravely ill. Here comes the outpouring of feelings. That's not how you show your attachment to Jesus. It's not that it's not OK to show that we love Jesus in those areas. But it's not perfect. But a perfect way to show it is what Jesus says to his disciples. Jesus told his disciples, this is how you show it. Show your love by obedience, by doing mine and the father's will. If you love me, keep my commandments. Love one another. That's his will. You see, if you want to show Jesus how much you love him, then show it by loving his people. Show it by obeying his will as it pertains to his people. You think the Lord wants you just simply crying and all broken up about some things pertaining to him and then not love his people? No, that's his will. Love his people. That's his will. When you put down you, when you take away from yourself, when you no longer about self and you about doing the things that pertain to God in his will. When you learn to deny self, when you learn to pick up your cross and follow him, that's his will. And you show that by obeying him. The obedient will show their love by obeying the master's will. And it's not a bad word. Not only that, the obedient will inherit the heaven. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21 through 23. In fact, before you go to Matthew 7, you go ahead and mark that. You can mark that down. But I want you to consider the question of Psalm 15. And then I want to answer it with Matthew 7. Psalm 15 is the question. Matthew 7 is the answer. Let's go to Psalm 15, verse number one. Look at this question. Read it for me. Brother Mike, you there? Read it for me. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy believers? Well, there's the question. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Now, the psalmist go ahead and give some answers, but I assure you the answer is also in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Who shall abide in thy holy tabernacle or who shall abide in thy tabernacle and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Well, then let's have to let, let the Lord answer it in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. 
Christ has the power to prescribe the terms of life and death and to judge accordingly. Hear the answer. How does it read? Wait a minute. See, the Lord has the right to prescribe the terms of life and death, and he has the right to judge accordingly. And what he has already decided is that it is not going to be those who simply mouth the words, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord is not going to be enough. Singing, oh, how I love Jesus is not going to be enough. What's going to be enough? Obedience. Obedience is going to be the terms that the Lord has prescribed for those who will dwell in his tabernacle, who will dwell in his holy hill. And he has decided that Lord, Lord in word and tongue is not going to get it done. Now, it's good to say, Lord, Lord, John 13 and verse number 13, but not enough to bring us to heaven alone by simply mouthing those words. Profession alone by mouth will not get it. Insincerity can be found in words. You see, when you start talking about who's going to dwell in his holy mountain, in his tabernacle, who's going to dwell in his holy hill, when you start talking about that, let me show you that what the Lord has said, what the Lord is doing is giving us the perfect way. Because if I try to do it simply on affections and simply on emotions and all those kind of things at the fate of someone's situation or because someone is getting sick or someone is dying, we know that's imperfect because we've seen it in our own generation. But obedience is the perfect way. But notice, some people can say a lot of things with their mouths and they can try to show themselves to be for you. But the Lord says, no, that's not in a perfect way. Therefore, I deny that way. If you want to enter into heaven, it's obedience. Look at Mark chapter 14. Look at Mark chapter 14. You see, insincerity can be found in mere words. Mark 14 and verse number 45. When you get there, read that for us. And as soon as he was come, he called straightway to him and said, Master, Master. Master, Master. What does he say? And kissed him. And kissed him. Who did this? Judas. Judas did that. Oh, if a person could get in on Lord, Lord alone. Judas himself would have been able to deceive the master because he came to him and he gave him the title master, master, and even showed his affection by giving him a kiss. Is that a perfect way? Mm -mm. Obedience is the way. Judas mouthed these words right as he was betraying our Lord and our master. A man could say to you today, my brother, my brother, while taking the knife out of your back can deceive you that way. So the Lord decided those who are going to dwell in his holy hill are not going to be those who just simply mouth the words, Lord, Lord, Master, Master, Brother, Brother. None of that's going to get it. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. You see, what, what Jesus is showing us is that obedience is the litmus test for what is in your heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of it, life issues forth. That's what Jesus said in Matthew, Mark chapter 7, verse number 20 and 22. We read the last hour. That what's in the heart is def what defiles a man. A man lives out of his heart. So you have to defile, you have to, you have to try to put a, put a, put a, put a, a guard on what comes into that heart because what comes in eventually is going to make its way out. And that, my friends, whatever's in there is going to end up being the thing that defiles you. It is the litmus test for what's in the heart. What do I mean? Obedience is. You see, one can do good and obedient, good, good, do good and obedient acts insincerely. But one can only do them for a short while. You can only do them for so long. And the Lord understands that. Sooner or later, your true and real surface, your, your true and real character is going to surface. So you can get away with some things for a little while. That's why we tell people when you're dating, don't rush in. I think they had a movie called Fools Rush In. Y'all ever heard that title? Fools Rush In. I never watched that movie, but I saw the title. And, I, you know, I'm always thinking sermonically. Fools Rush In. That's absolutely right. As it pertains to marriage, fools rush in. Because you don't give a person enough time. 
You sometimes have to give people time, date them for a little while, see what they're all about, get to know them, we tell young couples, get to know them, get to know their families, see, get their background, see what's going on with them. They got shows now where folks are married at first sight and all this kind of stuff. Now, it's tough enough when you done, when you done been with a person for 20 years, let alone never knowing the person, meeting them for the first time, and then deciding to marry them. To me, it's just another disrespect on God's wonderful institution called marriage. Man takes it so lightly and flippantly. He treats it like it's a, car, a used car rental. If I don't like her, I'll just turn her back in or she'll turn him back in and all these kind of things. Well, sooner or later, the real attitude and character will surface. This is why Jesus says, but he that doeth, that is continuous action, he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. So this is not a one time obedience. When you heard the gospel and you heard the terms of the gospel and you responded to those terms of the gospel. This is not once saved, always saved. This is not when you come in, you are always going to be saved no matter what you do and all those kind of things. You cannot lose your salvation. No, this is the individual who continues to do the will of the father, which is in heaven. Why is it a continuation? Because sooner or later, the real you going to show up. Sooner or later, the real you are going to show up. You see, this is not a one-time obedience. This is a lifetime of obedience. No wonder the Bible says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for you will reap in due season if you faint not. Oh, man, if all you had to do was obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and then just muster up enough courage to die in that moment, I would say that'd be a whole lot easier to just muster up enough courage and let them take my life right then and right there. It's easier to die, to die for Jesus than to live for him. Ask Peter. Ready to die in that garden, wasn't he? Took that sword out, cut off Malchus's ear, and Jesus told him to put your sword up. Sheathe that sword because he that lives by the sword should die by the sword. And I'm sure Peter was ready in that moment. He took that sword out. They could have killed the disciples right then, right there. So Peter was ready. However, the Lord had different plans for him. And the Lord told him Satan had desired to have you. The you is plural, you all, that he might sift you as sweet. But I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I'm sure Peter found out. From that very day, he could have died in that moment for the Lord and gone on to glory. But now the Lord said, no, you're going to have to live a while and you're going to have to take the gospel everywhere and you're going to have to stand for what is right. And you're going to have to take all that comes with it, the persecution. You're going to have to take some beatings and you're going to eventually have to die for this cause. Now, let me ask you a question. 30, 40, 50 or who know how many years of that? Is that easier or more difficult to die in that moment and go on to heaven? You see, this is about to test you. This is about to try you. This is going to be hard. No wonder he says obedience. Because if we all just had to do it one time and then that was it, we'd be fine. But no, now you got to go live it. Now you got to go live for the master. And you've got to be able to live righteously with all that comes in and challenges it. This is why Jesus could say in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 15. He said, beware of false prophets come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly of ravenous wolves. He says, ye shall know them by what? By their fruit. Now, I don't know if we have some tree experts in here, but I can assure you that I'm not a tree expert and I'm not a son of one. And I can't go outside if there's nothing on that tree and I can't tell you what kind of tree that is. Now, some people probably can tell you some they can identify some of those trees by the way they are shaped and all this kind of thing. I'm just telling you, if somebody can do that, I can't. And when I go out there and I see those trees, they all pretty much look alike to me. The fruit trees I'm talking about. And I don't know whether or not that thing is going to produce apples or oranges or, or what it's going to produce. But I know this. When those apples show up, you won't be able to convince me that that's an orange tree. <laughs> when I see those apples, I know what kind of tree that is now. I see those oranges. I now know what kind of tree that is. I know because the fruit is now telling me what it is. And so that's what we're talking about when it comes to obedience. 
Sooner or later, you can play a game and you can be you can be a hypocrite and you can pretend. But if we give you enough time, sooner or later, your fruit is going to it's going to manifest itself. And we're going to know what kind you are. Obedience, obedience, obedience. God chose obedience and no one should expect to be a citizen of the kingdom who does not obey the king. We're talking about obedience. We're talking about God first in obedience. In Acts 529, the disciples said to that council, and we ought to obey God rather than man. This was said in response to the charge of disobedience to the orders and demands of the council. God had commanded by the angels for them to go into the temple and to preach the doctrine of the gospel. Acts 5 verses 19 and following. And they said, we received our commission from God. And we ought not to lay it down for someone else. God commanded us to teach in the name of Christ. And the council commanded them not to teach in the name of Christ. And those men were obedient to what God said. And said, we ought to obey God rather than man. When it comes to obedience, my friends, God is always first. Anything and anyone that contradicts your obedience to God, let me tell you this. Go with God. God first in obedience. Salvation is offered to the obedient. Hebrew writer in chapter 5, verse number 8 and 9. Says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. He became the procuring cause of their salvation. Their salvation was to be traced back to the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It is not to save those who choose to live in sin, but it is to save those who choose to obey him. He is the author of salvation to all those who hearken to his voice and the gospel. If ever an individual wanted to come alive from that dungeon of sin, come out of that tomb of being dead in their trespasses and sin, they need to listen to Jesus. They need to hearken to Jesus. They need to obey Jesus. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter five, and verse number 25, he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. What are they going to hear? They're going to hear the gospel. And by the gospel, they'll be hearing the voice of the Son of God. And Jesus was ready. The kingdom was ready. Everything was now ready. And it won't be long before the Lord will die and will be buried and will be resurrected and will ascend into heaven and send the Holy Spirit. And those men will come forth with the gospel. And when they come forth with the gospel, all those folks who were dead in their trespasses and sin will hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear, those who hearken, those who obey, those who respond, will live life from the one who gives life. Coming out of their tombs, dead in sins and trespasses because of their willingness to be obedient to the voice of our Lord and Savior. Thank God we were obedient to the voice when we heard the call. Reason it's good to be obedient is because the disobedience is going to be punished. Paul says this to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1 beginning at verse number 7. He says, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. My friends, two categories given. Those who know not God, those who obey not the gospel. If you don't know God, my friends, that means that you don't keep his word. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. First John chapter two and verse number three. You see, that is a that is a that is a divine commentary on this on this particular word, on what it means to to know not God. You don't know him when you don't obey him. Hereby we do know that we know him if Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me. Keep my commandments. Hereby we do know that we know him. John, who was Jesus talking to? John was there. Hereby we do know that we know him if 
We keep his commandments. That's what it means to know God. This is what it means to love God. Obedience, obedience, obedience. How did it become such a bad word in our society? When God has so much to say about the word. We have to be careful that the word don't infiltrate our hearts and turn us against the way God uses these words in order to get us to respond the way he would desire. There is eternal consequences wedded to these things. He's taking vengeance on them that know not God. Who are they? Those are the ones who don't obey him. You see, if I don't obey him, I don't know him as he desires to be known. If your knowledge of him don't lead you to obey him, my friends, pack it up and go home. Do your own thing because it won't do you any good. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the ones who hear the gospel but will not respond to it. Reject it. You got people today that will reject the terms of the gospel. They just take out their pen knives and start cutting things out. Just like we cut out the word obedience. We cut out the word obey. And people start just cutting things out. And now the world cuts out baptism. Don't need it for salvation. Cut that away. All you have to do. Anytime somebody tell me all you have to do, I'm suspect. I'm suspicious of what's about to come next. All you have to do. As if to take everything God has said on the subject of salvation and then draw a conclusion with this one little thing. And then have a problem support, supporting it in scripture. I had people tell me all you have to do. All you have to do is just believe. Is what a group of folks told me at the end of a gospel meeting one day when I disagreed with their terms of salvation. All you have to do is just believe. I said, do y'all have a few minutes to show me that? Well, absolutely. We'll come down. We'll come down. Well, let's go down and sit down. Y'all show me that. All you have to do is believe. I want to see that in scripture. And they attempted to show me that in scripture. And they went to Romans 10, 9 and 10. To show me that that's all you have to do is believe. I simply asked them one question. I said, do you have to repent? They went to a scripture trying to get rid of baptism. And then I asked them, do you have to repent? Now, now I'm just using this. I, this is not the way I would cover that, but to humor them because that's the way they're looking at it. I would have just dealt with belief. I would have just dealt with belief and showed them what belief really is and the compartments of belief and all those kind of things and how it encompasses, you know, faith and baptism, all those kind of things. Belief will do that on its own. We don't have to go running all the chasing all those passages. But because that's what they wanted, I said, listen, um, um, based on your own reasoning, I said, does one have to repent? They said, well, of course. I said, it's not in that passage. You said, all I have to do is, and then you proceeded to tell me that I just believe in Jesus Christ. That's one thing. And now I get you down here and ask you, does, a one, does one have to repent? You say, yes. And it does not comply with the passage you gave me. And now we have two things. So is it all I have to do is believe or do I have to repent and believe? And at least we have two things. Well, I don't have to tell you how that turned out with that kind of reasoning as we went on into that type of discussion. And I started to show them how to take everything God said about salvation and show them illustrations of what happened and all those kind of things. And then we looked at what the words mean. And by that time, they started getting emotional and it turned into something else. Disobedience is going to be punished. You can't just wish these things away. Obey not the gospel of them which is the which of Christ, which is the author. He was the preacher. He is the sum and the substance. He is the good news and the glad tidings of the grace of God, of peace, of pardon, of righteousness, of life, of salvation. That is in Christ. They will be punished with destruction of the body and of the soul. Matthew 10, 28. Mark 9, 43 through 48. That's Gehenna hell, my friends. For those who did not receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. This obedience is so important that I'm going to take the rest of the day to get this out. Um, so we'll be dealing with this the next session as well. 
I don't know where to stop. I don't know how long I've been up here, but I know this. I think I got a little time yet, don't I? Let me show you, let's deal with no substitute for obedience. Because what we find in the world today is that people want to make some substitutions for obedience. Always trying to get around just doing what God says. And if we're not careful, it can be true of us as well. Some try to substitute knowledge. I'm going to show you several things that people try to substitute for obedience. Some try to substitute knowledge. Jesus said in John 5, verse number 39, verse number 40. In fact, let's go over there. John 5, 39, verse number 40. Notice what he says to the Jews here. <clears throat> when you get there, brother, read it for us. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. You think that by searching the scriptures you're going to find life. The Jews thought that by searching the scriptures, see, they were searching the scriptures. Jesus wasn't necessarily telling them, go search the scriptures. That's what they were doing. They were already searching the scriptures. He said, you think that by searching the scriptures, they are going to give you life. But the problem is, the life is in me. And you are rejecting me. You will not come to me that you might have life. And the scriptures that you're searching in for life are testifying that I am the one. I am the Messiah. The scriptures bear witness to Christ as the Messiah. But you will not come to me. Believe in me. Jesus saying, you will not come and obey me. That you might have life as pointed out by those scriptures that you are searching. That would be in other words, they thought that their vast knowledge of scripture was a good substitute for obedience. What should they have done, Brother Mike? Shouldn't they have obeyed Christ? But what had they gotten through searching the scriptures? They, grabbed, they gained all this knowledge, but that knowledge could not supplant their responsibility to respond to the Messiah. And yet, here's my knowledge, but no obedience. It'd be like us saying, well, if I go to Bible study and learn all I can, but don't obey him, it'll do us no good. And some folks, I tell you what, boy, they at every gospel meeting, they'll go all over the place and they'll learn all they can. But when it comes down to obeying Jesus, they just can't seem to do it. Knowledge is not a substitute for obedience. Jesus said in John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth, but the truth shall make you free. But you know, truth must be obeyed. Paul says to the Galatians in Galatians chapter three and verse number one, he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who had bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was evidently set forth, crucified among you. Truth needed to be obeyed. And the Galatian brethren were being courted by the Judaizing teachers and being pulled away from the gospel that they had received. They needed to continue to respond and obey the truth as was presented to them. In Titus 1 and verse number 16, the Bible says they profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Their conduct proved that they had no real acquaintance with God. You have to be real careful that you don't substitute knowledge for obedience. Let me do one more. Okay. Some try to substitute worship. Some try to substitute worship for obedience. Imagine that. There are some people who will substitute worship for obedience. Well, how does one do that? I'm going to show you how they do it. You see, people believe if they are sincere in what they are doing, that God must accept it. And especially is that the case when man worships God. We remember Paul was one who was sincere. Paul said, brethren, I've lived in all, since good, I've lived in all good conscience, even unto this day, Acts 23 and verse number one. 
And then Paul found out that his conscience was not clear. It was not right because he was not taught or not trained correctly. And upon finding out the truth, he then recognized what he was when he thought he was doing good. Now, he was sincere in that what he was doing, he was he thought he was doing the right thing, found out he was doing the wrong thing. And then he recognized that he had to be trained correctly by the word of God. Paul then referred to himself, First Timothy 1, 13 through 15, as the very chief of sinners. He was sincere. But sincerity alone is not going to get it. And some people try to take their sincere hearts and their practices in worship and try to substitute it for obedience, for what God wants. You remember Uzzah? Wasn't Uzzah sincere when he attempted to keep the ark from crashing to the ground? But God took his life for breaking his law. God has specified quite a few things. The, children, the Kohathites was the ones who were supposed to carry that ark, and there was a certain way they were supposed to carry it. They were supposed to carry it. They were supposed to have staves in the corner of that ark. They were supposed to have rings in the corner of that ark. And they were supposed to put staves through those rings. And then they were to bear it up on their shoulders. That way they wouldn't have to touch it. But oh, because they had gone to war with the Philistines and they had taken the ark and now God had plagued them and their gods. They sent that thing out of their camp. Israel retrieved it. It was being carried on a cart. By oxen, it got to the point where the oxen shook it and Uzzah put his hands forth. What was he doing? Wasn't he doing something so good and so wonderful and trying to keep that ark from falling? He put his hands up to keep the ark from crashing to the ground. And because he touched it, he broke God's commandments. He broke God's law. God killed him for it. That got David David's attention, didn't it? Sure did. In other words, Nothing you put in place of obedience is going to be acceptable for God, no matter how sincere and no matter how honest and no matter how honorable your actions. Man needs to learn that about God. God did not accept Cain's worship. Look at Genesis chapter four. Genesis chapter four. Man needs to learn this. He needs to learn and understand that God is not going to accept your worship in light of obedience. But some folks want to sacrifice. They want to do all of these things and they want to do them and they want to as if they want to put them ahead of obedience. My friends, when you worship, you ought to worship in the way God told you. If you're going to sacrifice or you're going to sacrifice to God, it ought to be according to his will. But if you do it and it's not in compliance with his will, I'm just simply saying there's no substitute for obedience. In Genesis chapter four, look at verse number five. Now imagine that you've got two boys worshiping and the Bible says with Cain and his offerings, God did not have any respect for his offering, but he had respect for Abel's offering. Wait a minute, brother Brent. I thought that God was not a respecter of persons. That's what the Bible says. Acts 10, 34, 35. Peter learned that God is not a respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. And so we learn that God is not a respecter of persons. There is no respect of persons with God. The Bible tells us that. So then why does God take one boy and he offers a God and another boy and he offers a God and God says, I don't have respect for this offering, but he had respect for that one. Well, according to Hebrews chapter 11, 4, one offered by faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gifts and by it he being dead, yet speaking. So he offered by faith, which tells us something about the other offering. That it was not according to faith. It was not consistent. When we talk about faith, we know this is not something. We know faith indicates that God must have revealed something to them. God must have told them something. They were informed as to what to do. And one did it and one didn't. But yet they both offered. You see, man believes as long as he offers a God in the sincerity of his heart as it turns as it pertains to his worship, that God must accept it. I'm here to say that is not true. You are not going to substitute your worship for God's obedience for obedience. Can't do it. Can't do it. But man thinks he can. But look with me, if you will. Let's go back to Genesis chapter four. And look down at verse number seven. You see, Abel offered by faith consistent with whatever God required and with proper attitude. And notice what God tells Cain. He, Genesis chapter four, and verse number seven. If thou doest well. If thou doest well. Shall thou not be accepted? Listen, the idea is if you had done well. In other words, God is not a respecter of person. 
if you had done what you were supposed to do, isn't that what we would say to our children? If you had done what you were supposed to do, you would have been accepted as well. And certainly the way the King James has it going forward, if you do well, you will be accepted. But had you done well, you would have been accepted just like Abel. I'm not a respecter of persons, but I am a respecter of character. I am a respecter of obedience. And he obeyed and you didn't. And if you had done well and did what I told you to do, the way I told you to do it with the right spirit and attitude, then I would have accepted you as well. Is that not what God would do for every one of us? But it's your responsibility to come in here and offer acceptable worship. You can't just do whatever you want to do. You can't come in here with your mind and your heart in every other place but where you're supposed to be and give God what he is due and expect to be accepted. And so Cain found out that he needed to do well. Well, what do you mean do well? I mean, do whatever he told you to and do it the way he told you to it, to do it. And do it with the right heart and the right mindset. God did not accept Nadab and Abihu's worship either. Look at Leviticus chapter 10. Look at Leviticus chapter 10. Didn't accept it. This is something that especially my friends of the denominational world needs to understand. They need to understand this because people are offering to God any kind of thing, everything they want. And thank God is supposed to accept it. No. See, you're trying to you're, you're trying to substitute worship for obedience. It's good to worship. But it cannot supplant obedience. You need to obey God and then your worship will be acceptable. But not to offer to God something you desire. In light or, or, or to, to the detriment of obeying what God has asked, what God tells us to do. Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. Notice what the Bible says. And Nadab and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, uh -huh. took each of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon. And what did they do? And offered strange fire before the Lord. Watch this. Which he commanded them not. And what went out? There went out fire from heaven and devoured them and they died before the Lord. And then Moses said to Aaron, this is that which the Lord has spoken. I'm going to be sanctified by them which come nigh me. And Aaron held his peace. Look with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 30. Let me tell you what happened here. They were not told to do what they did. They must have got a little overwhelmed about their positions. They must get a little excited. I'll offer this before the people. But notice Exodus 30 and verse number 7 and verse number 8. See if we get a little, little light on the subject. How does that read? And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. Uh-huh. And he dresseth the lamps, and he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Now, did you hear Nadab and Abihu's name? Aaron, their father, was the one who was supposed to be making the offering. And you know now that they are, they are with Aaron as his sons, they, as priests. He's the high priest. They are supposed to attend it with him. But Aaron is the one who is supposed to lead in making this offering. They had no right, no authorization. Moses wasn't there. Aaron wasn't there. And these boys went in and did this. But drop down verse number nine. You shall offer no strange incense. You shall what? I'm sorry. Say that again. You shall offer no strange incense thereon. You shall offer no strange incense thereon. That was forbidden. You see, if Moses had have been there and Aaron had have been prepared to do what he did, then he would have put the stuff together, put all the right mixtures together, and it wouldn't have been strange. Those boys went in and offered something that was common. They didn't even put the right stuff together. And when they offered something common, 
it went up before the Lord as strange fire. They had no permission from God. Moses wasn't involved. Aaron was not involved. And therefore, whatever they offered went up strange before the Lord and the Lord rejected it. It was common and unauthorized. Man should learn to offer to God what he asks and not what he doesn't. God didn't offer, didn't accept Saul's. Look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 15. In fact, I'll tell you what, let me take a break. Let me take a stop right here. Let me, let me take a stop right here because I'll, I'll have to go along long to even get this next point in. <laughs> and you look like you about ready for a break. And so just so we can kind of we can kind of get ourselves together and we can kind of just take a little break and then come back and I'm going I'm to kick in right where I am.